Thank you for coming this evening. Um, before I hand over to our founder, Vaughan Smith, um, if I can ask you to switch your phones to silent, and when it comes to questions, if you can wait for the microphone, because we are broadcasting live. Over to Vaughan. <coughs> Good evening and, and welcome. I think we can, all, can you hear me, yes. <coughs> um, this evening's event is about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, shell shock, battle fatigue, whatever they call it. But it's also about unreported or underreported suffering of war. Um, in, in this room, staring at you from the wall, is Don McCullen's picture, the thousand yard stare <coughs> from Vietnam. And PTSD is, is something that many journalists suffer from. I've, we've got many members of this club who have PTSD. So this, cl this club is, 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 is not far from it, uh, with um, Don McCullen staring from our walls. It's harder for us to understand than physical injury. Uh, in the Second World War, its truth was suppressed. And if you want to know why your grandfather never discussed the war, uh, then you need to read Charles Glass's book, Deserters. Charles Glass, a friend and founding member of the Frontline Club, is a journalist and writer and one time hostage in Lebanon. So he's somebody who uh, has had a, a, a not ordinarily uh, stressful experience himself, for sure. Um, he began his journalist career in 1973 at ABC News Bureau, Bureau and was chief Middle East correspondent from 1983 to 93. He's the author of Americans in Paris, Tribes with Flags, The Tribes Triumphant, Money for Old Rope, The Northern Front, an Iraq War Diary, and Deserter, which we'll be talking about today. If you want, to, if you want a sense of how it feels like to actually have PTSD, then you need to start by reading, I would argue, Chapter 10, um, uh, of Jake's book, Among You. It's truly moving. Jake Wood is a writer and is a former business, analyst, an, business analysis and territorial army soldier. He's author of Among You, the extraordinary story of, of a soldier broken by war. Um, I want, Charlie, could you please just describe to us your book a bit and explain a, 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 a bit about it to start us off, please? Someone asked me the question, did any American or British soldiers desert in the Second World War? And she asked me because she had never heard about it. And I said, well, I don't know. I, I assume so. I didn't know. So I looked into it and read, to my astonishment, that 100,000 British soldiers deserted and 50,000 American soldiers deserted in the war. And even more to my astonishment, I discovered that it hadn't been looked into at all. During the war itself, the few reporters who tried to file stories on it including Reynolds Packard of the United Press, who wrote about it in his memoirs, their stories were censored. In the immediate aftermath of the war, because it was, as Eisenhower called it, the, great, the crusade in Europe, it was the good war, it didn't fit the narrative of the good war. There's something called the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature in the United States, which is an annual, very thick volume, everything published in every journal, newspaper, and so on, for that year. You can look up any subject you're interested, whether it was about the White House or Eisenhower or Anything, it's, if anything, it was written about in the American print media of those times, of, of, even up to today, it would be there. But there was no entry for the word deserter or the word desertion from 1940 to 1952. In 1952, it appeared for the first time in relation to the deserters in Korea, because some, some Allied soldiers had deserted to North Korea and gone over to the other side. In 1954, a book came out about the, the only American soldier executed during the war, Eddie Slovak. And apart from that, then, the subject was not, was not dealt with at all. And it's part of a deliberate historic amnesia to take this, this out of the narrative. So I, what I was trying to do was to put it back into the narrative. Well, I, I think your book is absolutely rev revelatory in this matter. <laughs> uh, Jake, can you tell us a bit about your book? <clears throat> sure. Um, also, though, I'd, I'd just like to say that, um, that I do have a, uh, a mental disability at the moment. Um, so, if it's okay with you, I'd, I'd just like to read out uh, something about my book, and then we can talk about it later, if that's okay with you. It's okay, well. Okay. Um, th th essentially, the book is one of a 10-year like, psychological journey. I was a part-time TA soldier who did like, two tours in Iraq, uh, one in Afghanistan, did, uh, and has subsequently uh, been diagnosed with PTSD. Uh, the book's journey begins one night early in 2003, when as a young and and the like, idealistic man, I found myself looking across the border into, Ar into uh, Iraq, trying to justify in my mind why, or why I, I would be invading uh, that country the next morning. 
there was wonder and hope in those early days as we advanced quickly through those Mesopotamian marshes of deserts and towns. We thought you know, that we could be a force for good. Uh, but of course, these hopes were naive. I did, however, see how moral and black and white in like simple certitudes like day-to-day -day life was as a soldier when you are soldiering for real. In the most life-threatening and therefore life-affirming circumstances, you looked after the man next to you and he looked after you in turn. It may surprise you that I did not see this altruism in my other career, but banking, <laughs> when I returned home. I found myself completely alone at the back of that desk in Canary Wharf, where no one had the faintest idea what I'd just been doing and seeing. The only thing that had changed my absence was me. Unfortunately, even back in my TA Unit 2, I felt a distance between myself and my fellow soldiers. I'd been the only soldier mobilised from that unit who had gone forward on the ground like, during the invasion. I began seeing a girl at the bank who had written to me during the war, uh, but when this relationship floundered, I felt my isolation at home was complete. My TA unit was asking for uh, volunteers but for another Iraq tour. And my hand went up. I was returning uh, to an insane world, but it was one that made more sense to me as a soldier. That six month tour in 2004 was spent conducting like covert surveillance on Iraqi insurgents. Um, but, and here, I was back in my element. Yeah, but home was not done with me. During the months of pre-tour build-up training, my relationship with a girl had been rekindled. And halfway through my second Iraq tour, it died again. We cannot choose who we love. And I feel this experience of loss I want to mention this evening uh, because the added psychological weight of losing like, someone you love when you're facing death every single day like, cannot be underestimated. In Iraq, we were essentially helpless in the face of IEDs and mortar and rocket attacks. There is very little you know, that you as an individual on the receiving end you know, can do uh, to protect yourself from these lethal threats. <coughs> And as a soldier trapped thousands of miles and many months away from home, there is very little you know, that you can do you know, to rescue or resolve a relationship which is slipping away from you. It's half page one. Oh, you're all right. This pain you know, can become too heavy like, to bear. And so then you find yourself just emotionally shutting down and, oper and operating mechanically as a soldier without emotion like an uh, automaton. A psychologist and psychiatrist put a lot of emphasis on how these feelings of helplessness can affect the mind. If you have absolutely no control over your destiny, this is stressful. And this wears down your mental defences and when direct, lethally traumatic events happen around you. Back home, I muddled through the couple of years uh, um, uh, between this tour, you know, the RAC tour, and the next. I had some counselling, and I felt I was making uh, progress in my civilian career. I even started seeing someone new. But I still miss soldiering for real, but for all the reasons I've said. I was brought up in a military family, and my family always told me that soldiering was in my blood. And in the, in the summer of 2006, on television, I heard... Um, I heard pure, unadulterated war calling me with its debased siren song from some corner of the world called Afghanistan. <coughs> so I went, and in the summer of 2007, fighting season in Afghanistan, I fought and I, I killed, and I saw people I revered um, killed alongside me. And now I live with the aftermath of that death. In this mental prison, purely of my own making, called PTSD. I'm fortunate that I had the, you know, the foresight you know, to keep detailed journals 
and even record helmet cam footage of my experiences. These resources have helped a mind which I have to accept is now a shadow of its former self. As I forced myself to write, I didn't want to relive all over again what brought me to this place. But I knew that I had to because the words I wrote are my last attempt to find my way out of this darkness. Just as, just as a human being, I want to know what love is again because part of me still wants to live. Jake. Thanks for being with me. Okay. Jake, I want to read a paragraph that you've written um, that I think um, will make us understand a little bit about the experience of having PTSD. So, and you wrote this, and it's early on in your chapter 10, and I'm going to read it. With clamped eyes shut and sweaty fists, I sit with religiously tightened seatbelt pressing against my filling bladder, waiting for our window to blow out with explosive decompression. Or, we're talking, he's talking about taking a flight, his flight home. Or, for a section of roof to rip away, pulling people screaming into the sky. Or, for the hydraulics operating to the control surfaces to fail. Or, for the engines to disintegrate and burn. Or, for a wing just to rip clean off its route to the fuselage, sending it plummeting and spiralling with sudden negative G through all those thousands of feet of nothingness all before that final body-shredding impact into the ground below. I expect at least one of these things to happen at any second. So, you're struggling to take an aircraft there. <coughs> yes, I was, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, some of us obviously find difficulties flying, but I think this illustrates um, your experience. I want you to talk about it. Can you, can you explain to us a little bit about what, what the experience of PTSD is? Because um, I don't think we really understand what it's like. Okay. Um, one of the reasons I wrote uh, about that experience coming home on that flight was because um, I used to have a pilot's license. And um, I think uh, before the PTSD, the manner was before the PTSD is so very different in a number of ways you know, to the manner I am now with PTSD. As I said, I used to be a pilot, and uh, you could not be a pilot if, if that was what you're thinking about all the time. <laughs> so... Um, um, so, but that is, there's a long list of symptoms to the condition which is, has now been recognised as PTSD. As a human condition, this is nothing new. I mean, the name is new. It, um, but uh, the guys in the Second World War, who clearly, obviously, had PTSD. Um, and in actual fact, the ancient Greeks and Romans first documented uh, like psychological reactions you know, to trauma over 2,000 years ago. Humans don't want to die. Humans have an adverse a mental reaction, emotional reaction, you know, to when they are asked to kill someone and they'll see their friends killed beside them. But if you're struggling to take a flight and that's how hard it is for you, yeah. what else in normal, everyday life is sure. problematic? And can you explain some of that? Well, that's um, what I was uh, describing on the plane there. That's uh, uh, something called hypervigilance. <coughs> and that's the like psychological term which is has been coined now, you know, to describe that that um, that hypervigilance. Where um, <coughs> uh, whilst you're on tour in Iraq or Afghanistan or in in North Africa, wherever it was, um, you are constantly on alert for um, lethal dangers. And um, I mean, my experience in in Iraq and and certainly Afghanistan was was that. Um, as soon as you walked out of the gates of that FOB, you know, that foreign operating base, you could not relax for a, a second. Because Sod's law, you knew that second. You relax, you let your guard down, and that's when you get hit, and that's when you get killed. Um, so this, this constant, permanent living off your wits, of adrenaline and fear, um, that, it, in my experience, and I know I'm far from alone, that becomes seared into your psyche and, um, and part of PTSD is when you bring that state of mind back home you know, with you so it's not just um, you know, the flashbacks and the nightmares um, you know, the intrusive memories, it's not just that I mean, there's, it also affects your behaviour in other ways um, like fireworks night, a fireworks night you know, for me now is, um, is not a good night because there's, you know, there's lots of loud bangs and 
if I hear a loud bang now, it, it, in my brain that's been hardwired now into, um, you know, that loud bang means a lethal threat. And, and, and um, you know, so a fireworks display when there's constant loud bangs is, is just, um, you know, I, I forced myself, you know, to one or two and, and um, I experienced pretty much the same thing that I experienced in Afghanistan where um, it, it's, you can feel this, this um, upsurge of, of terror. And, and then it just becomes, I know now, it's when it becomes too much <coughs> that uh, the mind just switches off. And it's this natural self-defense mechanism. It's natural self-defense uh, mechanism that we've got built into all of us. Where uh, when the pain gets uh, too great, you know, the mind just emotionally switches off. Now you studied, and you that's the the thousand yard stare that, that you is, see there. Indeed, just, all the emotion is gone. Right. You studied psychology for a period of time, and interestingly, one of one of the characters in your book, um, uh, Charlie, studied. It was uh, John Bain, um, perhaps better known as Vernal Scannell. Um, studied no, psychology. A, no, it was uh, Steve Weiss. It was okay. So I got the wrong person, but. Um, <clears throat> And I'm quite interested in that, in so far as why did you uh, why did you feel the need to study it? I mean, I know the answer sounds pretty obvious, but um, there's something clearly wrong um, if you feel you need to study it. Surely there are experts out there to help you through this. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> and I did get um, you know some very good treatment from the army. Um, ultimately, that that hasn't been completely successful, but it, but I, I regard that as my failing, and not the failing of any of the. Uh, the you know, the mental health uh, professionals who like tried to help me. Um, I tried studying like psychology, you know, for what because I wanted to understand what was going on in my in my brain. Um, yeah, but um, but ironically, it, it was because I had PTSD that I I couldn't continue that course um, because uh, I was dealing with a any kind of massive like conflict of like complex unfamiliar. Unfamiliar information, but sorry again. Uh, uh, you know, just this this grey fog would come down, mm. and um, you know, and I I would have no idea what the lecturer was saying. What is it about young men? Um, I've observed it in, in my travels as well. Um, there's this huge desire to go and experience war. I mean, you had that clearly in 2006. Absolutely, you yeah. wanted to go back to Afghanistan, despite the fact you'd had some suffering from being in Iraq. Could you perhaps? Help us understand what it is about um, the manner in which the soldiers want to go out there, they love it until something goes wrong, and then the experience completely changes for them. In a way, you've actually you know, described the whole thing there. Oh, I didn't um, need to. Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like, um, I think the important thing to mention is that um, all the soldiers in, in the British and American armies n now are all volunteers. You know, there's no conscripts there, so um, we volunteered you know, to be a soldier, and there could be a whole a wealth of reasons why we initially volunteered to be a soldier in the first place. Um, mine was um, uh, had a lot to do with being brought up in a military family. Um, my mum, dad, uncle, cousin at the back there, um, all in the army, uh, and um, and I was brought up uh, revering achievement. In the military world, so I, I joined the TA. You know, you know, I joined the army. But then I think, if you train to do something for real, you want to do it for real. Otherwise, you know, it's, you haven't fulfilled your destiny in, in that chosen like sphere. It's like training to be a journalist and then never covering any stories or never doing any journalism. And um, but also, I think for young men and young women as well. You know, some of them anyway. Um, you know, there is this kind of lure to um, going to war. You know, I'm not sure if it's because it's you want to prove something to yourself or, or what. You know, for me, it was about, <coughs> ironically, living before dying. You know, I wanted to experience as much of life I had before I had to lie on my deathbed, and I was. And what I was really scared of was 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 uh, lying on my de you know lying on my deathbed and and wishing that I had done this or I had done that. Whereas you know, I'd go to war and I 
I experienced too much. Uh, and it's exactly what you were describing there. A lot of young men and women who are soldiers want to go to war, naively. Mm. Now with hindsight, but hindsight is not a wonderful thing. It's, it's a terrible thing. And, and um, I had exactly that experience. You know, I, I wanted to experience combat you know, for real. I did. And then and I kept on experiencing it. And, um, and then I, I realized how Retrospect, naive I'd be, uh, and um, you know, when you see someone who you revere, in the case of my company commander, killed, it's it's um, that uh, you know that kind of shakes you like, to your core, and you you know I emotionally switch off, and there's all these all these symptoms of PTSD, but you also I think reappraise what you've been doing with your life, so. It, War is, is the last place I go back to now. But maybe that's just because I've ticked that life experience box. Well, you certainly have. Um, Charlie, can I drill down on some of these statistics? Um, uh, one of the ones I, I don't think you introduced, these, these quite startling statistics, um, I, I think your book is very reve revelatory, but um, 20,000 deserters hiding in London at the end of the war, living in hiding and the police searching large areas of London. All of this was hidden from the British public, wasn't it? Well, no, at the time it, it was reported in the press because it? It, because it was impossible to ignore. <clears throat> there were huge sweeps through Soho every so often. They would raid all the pubs and the strip clubs and so forth. And out of any hundred men, they'd grab a dozen deserters. Yeah. But it became slightly ridiculous because you had so many people without identity cards, without ration coupons, who couldn't be reabsorbed into the society. And they had then to turn to a life of crime. They had to go to the black market to get false documents, they had to steal to live, and they, it was a real crime problem. So in 1953, uh, they finally gave an amnesty to them so that they could, they could regularize their lives, and uh, it, it, it changed everything. Your, your book, you talk about the manner in which the, the, the British administration uh, and, and Winston Churchill determined that they shouldn't be clear to the British public about the number of deserters there were. Um, I mean, I understand from your book that Paris was pretty well run for a few months afterwards by deserters on the run um, after its liberation uh, and stealing fuel. And it's clearly having an impact on the war effort and the numbers. Uh, could you as well explain why this number of 100,000 is, is actually much more than we could even think? Well, first of all, the, the black markets in Naples, in Rome, and Paris were for more than two years run by deserters in cooperation with local mafia, the Corsicans in Paris and the Sicilians and Calabrians in Naples and, uh, and Rome. Uh, and this, this meant not just, it meant the theft of petrol, which was crucial for tanks and, and transport. Uh, so much so in Paris, there was so much stolen that Patton didn't have enough petrol for his tanks when he went into the Tsar. And, and he, he, he wanted all of these deserters rounded up and shot because it, because it was costing him lives. And that was a completely understandable reaction. The, the whole thing was died down after 1946 in Paris and in, and in Naples and Rome similarly because then the local gangsters took back their rightful place <laughs> running the country. Um, I, I want to read a, a couple of passages, but um, I'm going to start by reading something uh, that, about your book. I found your book quite tough, um, and I liked it very much for it. Um, insofar as it, you, you explain, I think, because obviously the main cause for desertion isn't, which I think we should point out from for your book, is clearly not that you want to join the mafia. Uh, it's, it's because uh, of, of PTSD, pri PTSD primarily. But I just want to read out something that you wrote that, that definitely moved me. Um, and it, it was, I think you, you, you got it from Bain, um, which is Mr. Scammell, isn't it? Vernon Scammell. He, he, he changed his name to Vernon Scammell. Scammel. Famous, famous poet. Famous British He's poet. What he and Keith Douglas probably the two best British poets of the war. Of the war. Um, one of the most memorable and nightmarish things is hearing the voices of the wounded who have been badly wounded, the voice, voices raised in terror and pain. Shrapnel hit the company sergeant, a kind of father figure, 10 years older than Bain, hearing his voice sobbing and in fact calling for his mother who, um, who, who, who uh, and calling for his mother was so, I don't know, demeaning, Bain said, and he wrote some poetry about it. And the worst sound in the battle, the noises that I still hear, is the voices of comrades raised in agony and fear. And then there's something else I'm going to read as well. So I think there's another side of it. Um, and this was 
I understand, um, uh, by Mr. Weiss. I think this was Steve from Weiss. Steve Weiss, Weiss. Who's here? Ah, well, we shouldn't be talking to him hopefully later. We sometimes accidentally killed whole families while clearing out buildings. You didn't have to ask who was in the cellars when you tossed hand grenades in them. It was a terrible experience. Sometimes, too, a little girl or boy would come running out with one or both arms blown off, crying hysterically and wild with fear. We don't get that in the press, do we, in war? This isn't a coverage we're, we're getting. No, I mean, it, war is a horrible thing. You've been through it. I've observed it. I haven't, I've never been a combatant myself, but I've observed it. There are no pretty wars. I mean, pe children will lose their limbs. They will be killed. And it's, there's, there's no way of prettifying it. And the people who are doing it cannot not react. They can't, they can't just stand back and say it didn't happen. And it's, it, it scars them, too. And it's, there's, there's, no, there's no way of, of dressing it up. One of the things about this sergeant screaming out for his mother, this I came across in diaries, in letters, in government reports again and again and again. Most commonly when men were wounded or cut off and alone and desperate, they screamed out for their mothers. And in the, in the, in the, the book, The Psychology of the Fighting Man, which was distributed to all, all the soldiers, they also say this because so many psychiatrists had heard this from soldiers that in this moment, these moments of desperation and terror, they, cr they screamed out for their mothers. Remember, these were mostly boys, 17, 18, 19-year-old boys. But this chap wasn't. He was the father he was, figure, that, wasn't he? He was a father figure. You were 26. But you were still, you were still mm -hmm. crying out for your mother. That did, uh, one of the reasons I, I read both those passages is because there seems to be, and, and I'm hoping you can help me understand this, there seems to be two components to this sort of stress. One is guilt from having thrown a grenade into the, you know, into the, you know, i.e., having inflicting su inflicted suffering on others, and the other seems to have been from experiencing it yourself, or being proximity, or losing somebody who you depend upon, or or need, or something like that. Uh, have I got that right? I mean, and how do you manage these two <coughs> different parts of it? I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, this uh, one of the symptoms of PTSD, and now again, it's called uh, survivor guilt which is exactly what we're describing. Um, but to expand on that a little further, it's where um, obviously the death of uh, one of your friends affects you. But when you come back home, um, you can feel guilty for, for having survived when, when they died. Now, it's, um, you know, it's not something you can rationalize. You just, you just feel it. It's one of the few things that you do feel. Um, but then... Uh, also, and I can attest to this, uh, there's also guilt over, over killing. Um, and, you know, it's not palatable, and, and uh, I'll probably alien, you know, alienate a few people here when I say this, but, but uh, you know, when I went to Afghanistan, I, I wanted to kill. I wanted to soldier f for real, and I'm, I'm not proud of saying that. It's a shame to say it, but, but you know, unfortunately, it's true. Um, and um, it was after I came back from you know the Afghan tour that that, that uh, um, and I was re-immersed in in these in these cosy norms of life again. That like different meanings attached to things that you did and saw around in on tour. So uh, one of the Taliban that I I had a hand in, in killing. Um, I, I know his name. I know um, how he died. And I know how, I know some of his dying words as well because, uh, you know, we had guys who, um, interpreters who would listen on Taliban radio. And uh, after, after I've been firing a like, heavy machine gun in, into this guy's like, position, he, um, he got on the radio a lot to his um, his superiors, and um, in a transcript that says, you know, Musafa is crying, uh, possibly injured. Um, he was basically asking for help, and um, none of his superiors came to help him, and he, he bled to death that night in, in that compound alone, uh, because all his other friends had been killed, you know, beside him, and. Um, it's when you're confronted with the reality of what you've done that, that um, yeah, there can be like tremendous guilt over, over not just surviving but also like killing. Um, 
And uh, like I said, I'm not referring to Cynthia. Yeah, I, I made my decisions like to go, and I have to live with what I did. Uh, but um, yes, yeah, survivor guilt and like killer guilt, undoubtedly a part of PTSD. Charlie, I, I, I didn't quite extract out of you the significance of the 100,000 British soldiers. Um, um, what I'm hoping you might explain is um, why that is an extraordinary figure in terms of, there must have been, what, I think there were 3 million people under arms in, in the British military in the Second World War. So 100,000 doesn't sound so many. It is a lot when you talk about frontline combat troops, because most vast majority were frontline combat troops. We're not these rear echelon people who deserted mm -hmm. for to make money in the black market. So if you have 100,000 people disappear from the front lines when only 10% of your army is in the front line, it means your lines are exposed. I mean, if half of a regiment disappears, there's a big gap in the line. So it was a crucial military problem during the war, which all the military commanders were aware of and were unable to deal with. The American army grew from peacetime army of about 250,000 to 7 million men by the end of the war. So it meant that all the junior officers who should have been su providing support for young men were uh, basically inexperienced young men themselves and were not very good at providing the leadership that they needed to hold those men in the ranks. Now, some leaders were better than others, so that Steve Weiss' division, for example, the 36th U.S. Infantry Division in the Normandy, in the French campaign, had the highest rate of desertions in the American Army, which did not speak well of those commanders and those senior and junior officers who were not doing anything to stop this problem because they were, they were pushing these men to the limit. They were not rotated out of the front lines. So in the First World War, when a, when a unit became below strength, it was taken back, it was retrained, men were absorbed into the unit, and then they were sent back again. In the Second World War, they stayed at the front and they were replaced as individuals. So you could lose every man in your platoon and you would not know anybody, but you also knew because every man in your platoon had been killed, your life expectancy was very, very short. In fact, the average life expectancy in that division in the war was for a replacement was six weeks. This is devastating psychologically, and, the, and they didn't do much to address that. And this was, as, as you say, if I've got this right, this was simply a product in the manner in which troops were deployed, and frontline troops were pretty well kept there until, and then replaced individually as they wasted. Yes, and so, but they also were aware that 90% of the army was in, in the rear, yeah. having a relatively safe and comfortable life. Yeah. I mean, going out with the French and Italian girls and having wine and dinner every night and going sleeping in beds. I mean, just sleeping in a bed was unimaginable to those soldiers. They were, they were sleeping on the hard ground every night under Shelley. This leads me to another point about the role of leadership in such conflicts. Um, and uh, because I, I, I believe Mr. Weiss, it's Mr. Weiss, I, Weiss, I think, who in the book, was your book, uh, was talking about how he was deeply affected by what he felt was poor leadership at certain times, and that this contributed to his own difficulties by not being led. Uh, and actually, in the book, he talks about good leadership and bad leadership. And, yes. and interestingly, um, what seems to have played a large part in, in your difficulties, uh, Jake, seems to be when a commander you had great respect for um, lost his life in front of you. Um, could you perhaps talk a little bit about the impact of leadership and its importance on these things? It's absolutely vital. Um, I, mean, uh, I mean, that guy was called Dave Fix, mm. and he was the, the company commander of the, of the infantry company you know, that my artillery team I was attached to. And, I, and everyone, I'm not, uh, you know, this isn't just uh, speaking well of the dead, but everyone had um, the... the the, the highest opinion of like Dave Fix, not just because he was good at his job, but because he cared about his men. And um, when you're in a hostile environment, often you can feel that your destiny is not your own. And but then if you've got a guy in charge of you who who cares more about his men than he cares about. Um, Know, just kowtowing like, to his superior officers, that's a man you respect and that's a man you'll follow. And um, I mean, on another patrol, you know, you know we lost an, he was, no, he was not, he, he was 20, you know, we went on, on one long range patrol and we lost, we lost a guy on that. And, um, and Dave Fitz was saying to Bastian that we should not be going on this patrol. He talked about the, ex the exhausted state of the men, how we'd be outnumbered three to one by the Taliban, 
how we had no, no backup fire support, no, you know, no credible medical evacuation plan. And, uh, and he got on the radio to his superiors and he's saying we should not be going on this patrol. And they just told him to get on with it. You know, so, um, yeah, we, we deeply respected him and, and uh, unfortunately I could contrast that with the, how I felt about the artillery officer in charge of my actual artillery team who um, was a different kettle of fish. Oh. <laughs> um, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, he left and we never saw him again. And as far as I know, and no one keeps in touch with him now. And um, so I'm not sure if I can't. No, you have. No, you have. Go on, I think it's quite there, interesting because the well, leadership I'm, I'm is on, absolutely vital. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm on a slight journey here in terms of. Um, I want to go back to you, Charlie. You know, hundred thousand British soldiers, uh, almost all of them probably suffering from PTSD. Uh, it's it's a massive failure by the people who led them. Who who uh, and and in your book you talk about not just that and not just about the the manner in which we need to clearly understand these people, but also about the way they were treated, about how we went to treat them. And and um, we've all understand that. Um, uh, you know, shooting deserters wasn't a policy that was adopted in the Second World War. Can you talk a little bit about what was adopted and actually how tough it was for somebody who um, who had deserted? Um, uh, because these two things, I, you know, I'm trying I'm trying to examine whether you know to what extent is this a failure of the people running these armies as much well, as if you else? if you were lucky and you had a commander like Audie Murphy when he became an officer, yeah. he worked his way up through the ranks and had fought very bravely as a, an enlisted man, and he understood the enlisted men and was very regarded by his men when he became an officer as a very good officer. When a man broke down, and he describes it in his autobiography, broke down and said, I just can't fight, Captain, I just can't fight, I, I, I don't know why, I'd want to. I, some officers would have sent him straight for court-martial. Yeah. He sent him to a medical center for, for treatment. Is that Murphy? Audie Murphy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, so that was the difference, if, if people understood. Most, I mean, by the way, through the war, they, they understood that this was a problem, and, and both the US and British armies put psychiatric units in every frontline medical yeah. station so that there, there was the possibility of psychological treatment. It wasn't usually used. In fact, what the preferred method for many of the officers was any man who broke down and wouldn't fight would, would be court martialed, which meant that some of those who broke down went and hid and tried not to be caught. Some knowing they could be treated, would go for treatment, and then would be reabsorbed into the military. But, but courts were issuing, in court martial in courts, and military courts, lifetime hard labor for people. Well, if you read the transcripts in the book of the court martials, you realize that they, they, they lasted an hour or two. The defendants met their counsel for maybe a half an hour before, never had a chance to put their case, were frightened of the, of the whole military hierarchy, just as much as they were of the war itself and were, were handed uh, sentences of life, at, life imprisonment at hard labor at the age of 18 or 19. Some, some, I'd like you to talk a little bit about sort of Mustafa Barracks as well, because I think that's an illustration in your book which I think helps us understand the way these people were, were treated. Uh, John Bain, Vernon Scannell, was sentenced to 10 years at, at Mustafa Barracks. When he got there, he was broken down, he was humiliated, um, beaten, uh, made to do absurd tasks. The men were not allowed to talk to one another. Talking was a punishable offense three days on bread and water in the hole, which was an unimaginable thing in that desert, the heat in the hole. Um, they were, one of their tasks, and this is straight out of Catch-22, one of their tasks was to go to a huge hill of sand at one end of the, the quad, spend all day carrying buckets and rebuilding it at the other end, and then the next day taking it and rebuilding it again on the other side, every day. So, Charlie, some people would say, well, hang on, these are deserters. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's only fair that, they, that they're not rewarded for deserting. Um, and I'm sure that you don't agree with that. Um, but um, you, you observe as well uh, that actually they had much more uh, sympathy from people who were frontline units rather than the rare echelon units. Can you, can you explain that a little bit? Because I think that was well, when, people. when all of these people deserted from the front lines. It was almost unheard of for their comrades on the front to turn them in or to look down on them. Because most of those men in their own writing um, said that they felt that urge themselves at some time or other. So they understood it was when, and, and Steve Weiss had this, this experience and many others did, John Bain had it, when they went to the rear echelon, those soldiers who never saw battle despised them and turned them in. 
it was a very different attitude between the front and the rear. You see, I mean, I found that very informative because it, it is simply not what we're led to believe uh, ab about this. This is not the, the idea that is promoted to us about deserters, the idea that actually the empathy they're really getting is from people who've had shared experience. Now, most of them who did record or write down their, their recollections of the war and were under extreme stress for all those months said that it, there, was, there were always times when they either thought of deserting or shooting a toe off or some other way of getting out of this because they felt the only other way they're going to get out of it was to be, to be killed. I want to open it out to questions now, please, on account of... <laughs> um, have we got some microphones? Hi. Um, your book, for me, is an incredible way of persuading people to not join the army <laughs> because it is so horrendous. And what I'm wondering is, for me as a pacifist, for other people who think you know, war is inevitable, I wonder if conflict resolution is something that really today, modern times, civilized, we should be advocating and whether we're not going there because the power of the military producers are pushing the, the, their sales of war equipment and therefore influencing our governments. And so people like Blair just go to war, even when the country was so against the Afghan and the Iraq war and people felt so bad to be in it. And now, you know, even you've learned that even at the front, they don't want to kill people. Is this for me? Charlie, it's going to be for you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are, um, I agree with you about conf conflict resolution. And in, and in the, the most recent wars, Iraq and Afghanistan, that, that the Brit British and the Americans have, have been involved in, uh, all of those young people, because now it's men and women, all of those young people who were sent, were sent by men in Washington who had dodged the draft during the Vietnam War, Rumsfeld, et cetera, all of those people. Um, Tony Blair, who'd never been in a battle in his life. It was very easy for them to regard the army as a tool for their policies, just a, a way of them solving problems. But if, perhaps if they had had the experience, they would have thought twice about what they were going to be doing to the people at the receiving end of all of this armament, as well as to, to people like Jake, who come back shattered. I, I mean, historically, by the way, this, this shattering is, 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 as you say, not new. An interesting thing that I discovered was in 1942, when the US came into the war, but started fighting in the war, there were still 67,000 veterans of the First World War in veterans' hospitals. And half of them, a full half of them, were psychiatric cases all those years after that war. So when you think about going to war, you've got to think, what am I doing? Okay, what am I doing to the people at the other end? And what am I doing to my own people, putting them through that, so that 20 years from now, half of them will still be in psychiatric hospitals? This is a heavy, heavy responsibility, which I don't believe Tony Blair or those neocons in Washington ever considered, and still don't consider. <clears throat> a, a, a question here. Can we have a microphone? Lots of questions. This is great. I don't think I need oh. the... Oh. oh, yes, you do, because we're recording, I'm afraid. Have, is there a microphone there that we can pass? The, to, so can you pass the microphone? And um, we will come back to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, Quite some time ago at King's College, where I'm on the faculty, about 20 years ago, I met Leonard Cheshire. Leonard Cheshire flew 150 missions over Germany and Europe uh, during World War II and won the Victoria Cross. Uh, he came there to talk. And after he spoke, I went over to him. And in my admiration, I praised him for what he did because he was there at a particular time when his country needed him. But what I came away with was something he said to me after I congratulated him. And he said, what are you doing now? And I want to ask you the same question in terms of what you experienced having suffered from post-traumatic stress. And my question has another side to it. What kind of treatment did you have? Are you in treatment now? And how do you feel about the progress that you've made? But what are you doing now and in the future? Thank you.
can I give that one to you? Sure, okay. Um, what I'm doing now is um, this. I don't mean that to sound glib. What I mean is that um, I, I finished writing my book um, middle of last year. And, um, and I'm now going through, you know, I'm reaching the end now of this like publicity phase. And, but, um, and I'm trying to work out what I'm going to do after that. Because while I was writing the book, when I came back from Afghanistan, it was, it was this all-consuming um, purpose like, to my life. My, you know, my banking career had gone and my army career had gone as well, both ended by the PTSD. And I, was, I, I divide my time between being treated like by the army. Could you describe a little bit? Sure, yeah. Well, I think with well, the treatment that um, is on, on offer now, at least with the British Army, I can only speak for the British Army, I think it's... Um, we've only got that thanks to um, veterans such as yourself, Mr. Weiss. So I want to thank you for that. Um, and... Um, it's only through experiences uh, you know, with veterans such as yourself in the Second World War and, and Korea, often forgotten, you know, the Falklands, like Vietnam, that look, this, this condition, this, this completely normal reaction to abnormal events has been given a name and it's recognised. It's got this, this diagnostic criteria now and it's like, oh, okay, right, that, that's, that's, but that's, you know, that's called PTSD. So, you know, that's recognised now. So um, I had about three and a half years treatment through the army um, with a psychologist employed uh, uh, by the army, and um, I mean I could reel off a whole a whole load of acronyms now, but, but there's also different kinds of treatment. There's uh, like CBT, which is basically talking about it, it's essentially exposure therapy. You force your brain to relive in visceral detail everything that it does not want to relive. And this sounds masochistic, but the like, theory is is that by forcing the brain to you know, to process you know the past, it can it can do just that. It, it can come to terms with it, and and um, and that's when it won't be in this quarantine part of your brain, which all the flashbacks like uh, bubble out of. Um, I had a problem though. And it's just a personal problem I had in that I, I couldn't emotionally let myself go in front of my psychologist. It was like, as soon as I felt this emotion like bubbling up, just, you know, the emotional shutters would come down. But that's my failing. That's not a failing of, of that psychologist. Um, so, you know, this is an, another reason I wrote the book. But, you know, I wrote the book was because I, I wanted to do everything I could to kind of you know, kind of heal myself and, you know, to have some kind of life after, after all this. And, um, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I know that, that, um, I would like a partner again. Um, you know, that I could learn to love. And I mean that, learn to love. Actually, maybe learn to love me. <laughs> Um, but um, maybe not. And um, that's essentially all I'm on now. But but it's it's thanks to veterans such as you know, yourself that the PTSD has been recognised. And now you know the army gives me a pension. It's a pensionable injury now. It, it's you had to fight for it, though. You had to fight for it. Oh yeah, I had to fight for it. Yeah, God, yeah. I mean, it's like any insurance company. Any reason to wheedle out of it, and and. Unfortunately, that was my case, and that was that's the last thing um, a soldier with PTSD needs is to have to be fought to be heard. And if I didn't have you know, some lawyers acting for me uh, pro bono, I'd, I'd be fucked. With it. Um, I'd be fucked. Um, so, but it's but it's on paper at least anyway. It's a recognised but pensionable injury now. So I'm I'm secure now, and I just need to. I think I would like to write again. In the future, I don't know what about, but 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 I see that as my future now, and hopefully, you know, a future with someone else. Is that kind of answered your question? You live in London. You live in London. Yes, I do. Okay. Yes.
I want to crack on with some more questions, please. Um, can we, you've got, the, whoever's got the microphone, go for it. Steve asked me the same question a few years ago, actually, after I came back injured from, from Iraq. I think, what are you going to do now? And he's been a, he's been a real, really good friend to me. So, yeah, if you do live in London, I'd recommend um, hooking up with Dr. Vice every now and again. Uh, that's cool. much better treatment than I think. Um, as um, supportive as you were of the army treatment, much better treatment than I think you're ever going to get from the, the British Army. And um, ev I mean, I actually had, had my own question, but quickly, just a couple of points to come come, come back on from, from the discussion we've just had. Um, firstly, I think there's a, there's a huge levels of stigma attached to uh, injury of any kind, whether it's physical or uh, mental, and um, suggesting that it's your failing. I, I mean, however you want to conceptualise it yourself, that's, that's obviously uh, fine. But I mean, I, I, w I wouldn't see it that way myself. Um, if it, it should be up to the, uh, the military and society at large to, um, to, to be more um, accepting of, of people who are brave enough like yourself to, um, to, to say they're having you know, PTSD. Um, uh, the other thing I'd like to say, actually, is, is that you, you mentioned that you were getting treatment from the army, but at the same time, you were uh, having to marshal lawyers to, uh, sort of to, to, to fight for <laughs> the right to actually have a, have a pension. Um, very, very common, I think. I mean, I, had a, uh, I, I was unfortunately blinded in Iraq in an instant in which four people were killed. But um, I think about a week, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Kings, Kings London are doing a sort of an investigation into uh, particularly challenges that are fa facing combat blinded uh, young uh, veterans. And they said to me, you know, who's, the, who's the person who's supported you the most? And like, I immediately said my solicitor, and they said, what's, what's your best advice to anyone who gets injured in any way? And I said, tool up with some fucking good lawyers right away. Because, yeah. because seriously, it, it's, that is it. And in terms of a legal case against the MOD, I mean, I personally consider that as three and a half years of, of being tortured, basically, by, by my own state. Um, so, you know, I hope now that that's over um, for you and you've got a pension. I think, from personal experience, that's a huge stress that's taken off. And once that stress is taken off, then you can start to heal in other ways. Certainly, that's how it, how it turned out for me. Um, in, in t t sorry, sorry to take the floor for a few minutes, but no, you're, you're this good. is actually my question now, um, which is, um, uh, Vaughan, I think um, at one point in the discussion, you said you pointed to two specific aspects of PTSD, um, one of them being sort of the experiences you've seen, and one of them perhaps being guilt at, uh, guilt at surviving. Um, they're very personal, uh, almost physi physical or physiological, perceptual um, sort of uh, a attacks or assaults. Um, but um, and Jake, you also mentioned that um, you know you uh, saw the death of someone you revered, and that was a, a huge trauma for you. And so, I want to sort of maybe suggest that there is another aspect to PTSD, broader broadening that death of something you revered to a concept of, of faith in the whole sort of neo-imperial project, basically. And I wonder whether, I mean, this is certainly something which I took from my experiences um, uh, in, in the military, which is you, 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 you come back and um, you see, um, you know, I, I know you, you know that, you know, if you were doing, com you know, close surveillance of insurgents, you know we're doing assassinations, you know, um, you know, it's all coming out now, Mark Allen, MI6, you know, these Libyans who've been tortured, rendition, collaboration uh, with, you know, the Americans who had a different legal system to us, but, you know, you, you come back and you, you look at what, what's actually happened, the Lancet report, 2008, 700,000 civilians dead in Iraq as a direct result of our illegal, um, as the UN understands it, our illegal war there. Um, and I just wonder whether there's an aspect of PTSD which is you kind of you look around at the complete collapse of morality that permeates our, enti our entire foreign policy and defense policy, and you realize that you were sort of a cog in that, in that wheel, and whether that is also 
a sort of a lack of faith. That's also the death of something that you revered. And that maybe some of those deserters, yeah. I mean, it would be impossible to desert now because it's yeah. such, a, such a different sort of, I mean, where, where would you run to? And how <laughs> you know, um, but um, I, I think in a sense, the deserters now are people like, I don't know, just off the top of my head, maybe someone like Craig Murray, or someone like yourself, someone who just says, no, fuck it, I'm, the, the project is actually wrong and I'm walking away. And some of those people walking back from the front might have just thought, you know what, I don't, I don't believe in this anymore. I thank you. Thank you very much, mate. Um, I think something um, that Charlie touched on in his book is like, uh, if you can desert or not, depends on, on where you're doing a tour or not. In Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, you can try deserting, but uh, you're just... <laughs> No, you're going to get beheaded in, in you know, just a matter of minutes. So, uh, and I think this is why people didn't desert the exactly. Japanese theatre because yeah. on those yeah. islands there was nowhere to go. Yeah, there was nowhere to go. But but, but they still had the the. Um, they still know, suffered. Didn't they? That's the the psychological reasons. Yeah. I mean, they were still there. Um, um, I think I, I, I personally did lose faith in crucially how the Afghanistan campaign was being fought. Um, and I'd been gradually losing faith th throughout the entire six, you know, that particular six months tour. You know, lack of helicopters, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, equipment. You know, you know all of this. Um, but it was at the point the day fix was killed that that that, it, and in actual fact, yeah, day fix was killed. And then uh, a few days later, I was the only guy left in my team. Everyone else had either been flown out or or been injured, and I was the only. And it was at that point that I thought, "So I'm a swimmer. F fuck this. Just what the fuck? You know, just uh, 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 our Ford, our Ford operating base was hadn't been fortified. It it had been established, like you know, you know to take attention off, like saying it. And um, and that plan worked, you know. You know, back at Bastion, it said, "Yeah, that plan worked." You know, Sangin's not getting hit as much, which is you know, a local town. Inkerman or Fobs getting hit, and instead, okay, the plan worked. What they hadn't thought they had to do though was fortify Inkerman. So we just had you know mud walls, uh, you know, which got blasted to shit. And what, what a fucking surprise! You know, you know, people started dying, and and um, it was at that point I lost faith. But but crucially, it was it was in. Um, in the way the campaign was being fought, I did not think it, it was, it was under-resourced, it was incompetently led at times, and it's just my opinion. And, and the reasons for us being there are questionable. Now, we've got lots of questions. Um, I want to try and give everybody a chance to ask questions. So if we can pass the microphone around, but please can we keep them as short as possible uh, so that we can get it, give everybody a chance. So uh, where's the microphone at the moment? OK, I won't hold the floor. I'll just make a statement, and it's related to uh, several strands that have emerged so far. I had PTSD as a result of service in the fire brigade. I was so... I'm John Durkin, by the way. I'm now a doctor. I'm a PhD specialising in post-traumatic growth. And the seeds of my new career came out of something that you've touched on, which is camaraderie. And what it has done for me, psychologically, philosophically and personally, is demonstrated how powerful and how strong and how respectful we are of each other in uniform, in service, and how it overshadows what looks to me like a betrayal of us by the medical psychiatric authorities who peddle what they refer to as treatment. I'm aware of how many millions of pounds is quoted as being spent on veterans, how many thousands of hours of treatment, and I've yet to find an example of somebody who's recovered. Now, my practice is one that facilitates post-traumatic growth. And the demonstration has come out of work I did at Tiguin a psychiatric unit for veterans from as far back as the Falklands. And in every single case, 
of the men that I met in one morning or one afternoon, they resolved their trauma and went home. No three years worth, and I had as many years as you, learnt how to adopt what you and I probably would have in common if we were to sit down over a pint. And I now believe, and here's an invitation to you, I can take men with post-traumatic stress disorder, train them after they've resolved that disorder, and I'll teach you to do it for your mates. And if there's any doubt about whether this is fantastic or not, this is the testimonial from the care manager at Tigwin before its closure in 2005. And it's that that inspired my PhD. My concern is that there's far better things we could be doing with psychological casualties than simply peddling pills and therapists that serve the industry that seem to have gathered around trauma. That's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Again, you, please let's try and compact it a little bit or we're not going to get everyone a chance. Can we pass the microphone around? I want everybody to get a chance to ask a question. There we are, sir. Hi, Jake. Uh, Tom Hargreave. Um, interested in the uh, discussion about whether the real stress is what's inflicted on you or what you inflict on others. And uh, I bring that up as my experiences as an Apache pilot, where personally I didn't particularly feel any, any sort of uh, harm coming my way, but we, by Christ, we dished it out. Um, and then, interestingly, touching on what you said, you get to hear about it afterwards, so we got a tape to go through, and you really have the tape many, many times to assess what you've done. What would you say is the more powerful of the two, what's inflicted on you or what you inflict on others? Um, okay, Antoine, I mean, there are some days when, when it's, it's Dave hates, you know, Dave fixes his face, that keeps me awake, and then, you know, the, you know, there are other nights where I can't sleep because I'm, I feel I've damned myself, literally, for what I've done. Um, it's... They're both there, and I, I guess in terms of um, a frequency, you know, compared a lot between the two, I think they, I think they're about the same. Okay, cracking on wherever the microphone is, please pass it. Around. Excellent, thank you. Uh, hi, Mark Slack from Cambridge. Um, Charlie, your book's a book um, I've been waiting for for 25 years, and resonated pretty strongly. I did a couple of tours of duty in South Africa in the Angolan War. Um, as a 25-year-old doctor, and um, I was struck. My first three duty uh, tours were with elite units who were pretty motivated, pretty trained, and pretty much enjoying themselves. My very last one was to a regiment of territorial army guys who had haplessly been called up for the first time. They'd been playing war for 10 years, but now they were in it. And I joined them six weeks after um, they had started their tour of duty and was shocked in the morning when they flew me in by helicopter in the middle of the night. I was shocked by how thin they were. I was struck that they were almost emaciated. And, you know, I went to the commanding officer, he said, no problem with the, with the supply lines. And what had struck me, I then watched them um, over the next couple of weeks, and they couldn't eat. And you had a line in your book from Weiss when he spoke about waiting for Normandy, and he said, um, he said, people were eating, people were looking. He said, mine resolved around a persistent ache in my stomach. And I used to question these young troops, and they all said they had a feeling of butterflies, the feeling you get before you stand up in public, the feeling before you're nervous. And so they couldn't eat. They could not eat their ration um, packs in, in a day and were slowly wasting away. And I came to the conclusion that there were three groups of people. There was the 20% who thought that they'd landed up in the best place in the world, a war. There was 20% who'd been trained and maybe were able to take leadership from those 20%. And the rest, if attacked, would do a runner. And we had planes come over one afternoon. We spent three hours trying to get the guys out of their holes and injecting them with Valium. We, I, I knew quite obviously we could never prosecute a war with those men, which is why I'm sure in the Second World War there was only 10 or 20% in the front line, because they knew it. The officers know it. You just fill them up with the other 10 and 20 percenters. And so I have a concept of what I call immediate traumatic stress syndrome. 60 to 80 percent of those boys were traumatized the first time they come under fire. And so I wish your book goes out to as many people who've been in war before so they can live and be comfortable with the fact that they're quite normal and they're not abnormal and they don't have to have the guilt, which I know a lot of them had because they used to write to me. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
I just want to uh, say I, I haven't read your book yet, but I would like to, and I'm going to. Um, my father, and this is probably the first time that I've ever said it in public, um, was a deserter from World War II. Um, he lived, has lived, um, 50 years, or oh, six, no, he's 94. He has lived 70 years with post-traumatic stress. He was, um, he was diagnosed with it when he was 87. And the British government did give him a war pension. Um, he is now very ill um, in a hospital and he thinks he is in a correction unit because as far as he's concerned, an all male environment um, to him is a correction unit. He served 100 days in, um, we think, in Cairo. We're not sure, but he was sentenced to three years and served 100 days. He was then put back into the field. He served um, for another year and a half up through Italy. I think I wrote to you. Yes, you did. Yeah. Um, he eventually went AWOL again in um, 1944. He was free for um, 16 months. Uh, he was looked after by a village in Italy um, who have become lifelong friends to me. It was the only place that he ever felt comfortable. It was the only place he ever felt free. When he came back to this country, he was... Um, uh, his, fam his family were very good, but there was a lot of people that wouldn't talk to him because he was a deserter. He served two years in this country. Um, in detention barracks. Um, he talks about being shipped back from um, Rome in cattle wagons and big open trucks on trains. Um, he has lived with the shame of being a deserter for 70 years. And I don't think there has been a day that has gone past that he hasn't um, felt the shame of what he did. Um, did he have any treatment? No, because up until he was, um, up until he was 80, 80, no, 85, um, we managed to hide it. Um, I'm sure you can hear, for me, uh, we lived with the shame. Nobody knew what he had done um, for years. Um, nobody in the family spoke about it. Um, it wasn't until I was old enough to speak Italian that I spoke to the people to find out why they were our friends, because I had no idea why they were friends um, until I was a teenager. Um, and once we had, once I had spoken to them and I realised that he had deserted, they managed to tell me the story. But my father never spoke about it until he was. Um, until he retired at 75, um, he managed to find a job that he loved that kept him outside. He could never stay for any length of time inside. He had panic attacks constantly. Um, the only thing that kept him alive was his job because he was outside. Um, he used to work, for go uh, work on golf courses and he built golf courses. And I think he worked for some very... He, he worked for the Aga Khan in Sardinia. He worked for the president of, of the Ivory Coast. He worked for various very high-powered people. But nobody ever knew how much he kept hidden. Um, he could never work in an office. He could never write anything because he could never go indoors. Um, most of the time when he was at home, we never went into shops. I remember as a child always standing outside a shop. Um, because he could never go inside. And he eventually shut down, and he did actually shut down completely when he was 85, 86. Um, and he had that stare. And I can remember standing with my husband saying, he looks like somebody from, um, that's come out of Belson. He looked like somebody that had just been released from a prisoner of war camp. It, it was... If it's, if, it's, if it's of any consolation at all, since the book was published, I've received 
quite I a few letters sure. like yours from people whose, whose fathers had deserted and to whom it had been a very shameful thing or a secret thing. And now they're beginning to discuss it and understand that there are, because there were 100,000 of them, it wasn't just that one man was a terrible person and a coward. The circumstances were such that inevitably a certain number of people would never be able to take it. And you didn't, it was unpredictable who could take it and who couldn't or which days you yourself could take it, and which days you couldn't. So there, I, 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 your letter, I remember, and I, and I wrote back to you, I, I, was, I was very moved by it, but it was the first of, of, of many. I'm sure it was. Um, what I would like to try and find out is, we've tried to get a pardon for him, um, and I have actually spent three years, four years, writing backwards and forwards to um, Ministry of Defense. We've tried to find records. We have his military records, which are the vaguest why they even bother to write them on paper, I don't know, because they are the vaguest uh, sheet of paper you could ever get. Um, but we cannot find any medical records, we cannot find any court martial records, and without any paperwork, the government will not give him a pardon because of the post-traumatic stress. So we are now stuck that, bless him, as at 94, 95, um, it was something that I wanted to do before he died, was to give him a pardon. He never claimed any medals until he was 80, and that was only because I went and got them. Um, but I would like to know is in, in he, I know he, he was in prison or he was in a detention barracks in North Africa, but we have no idea where and we cannot find out where. Well, there weren't very many. It was probably the most of a barracks at Alexandria. And a few, some of those ah, records. So that's why he talks about Alexandria. So some of those records are in queue with the National Archives, some of them. We've, we've spent hours. <laughs> oh, I see. But the Mustafa Barracks has, a, there are f some files just about the Mustafa Barracks. You might find something you there. You might find something there. There won't be anything by his name. No. Because actually, I have to say, compared to other national archives, the national archives here are not very well catalogued. And so you have to go through mountains of material to find what you're looking for. But there might be something in, that, in the records of the barracks itself that, that would give you some clue. But you might also need a lawyer. I think uh, we've got to the point now that we don't, we know that he wasn't, um, I mean, I, I know what he did when he was in, in Italy. Um, I mean, they, he used to, he, they run quite a, quite a good racket. He, told um, me. he, he was in Perugia, so um, he ran quite a good racket. Other questions, if we can pass the microphone around. Again, we've got less than 10 minutes, please, so let's keep it tight. And we can all go down to the bar afterwards and carry, carry on the discussion. Um, thank you very much. My question's for uh, Jake, um, and it relates to his comments about comradeship. Um, have you ever been invited to um, give presentations such as this to the banking fraternity? <laughs> well, um, that, that is a perfectly serious question, yeah. because I think if you were... Um, your situation and those of your colleagues might be different and the nation might be a lot, a much better place. Okay. Next Thank one. I'll uh, answer it very, very briefly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, I haven't known, but um, my, I'm aware of um, standard sort of like briefings given to employers who will be banks by my TA unit and, and other ones as well, but that's going to be along the lines of Yes, let your employees join the other TA because you know they'll because they'll have lots of like transferable skills which, which they can bring to the, uh, the civilian workplace like shooting and stuff. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, so I haven't no. Um, I'm never going to be a, a recruitment tool f for the army now. You know. Microphone. Far away. Uh, Joe Mankiewicz. I'm prompted by the doctor to recount my own experiences. Over the last eight years at my local gym, I've met four different guys suffering from PTSD who've been in Afghanistan or Iraq. And they've complained about not getting what they're entitled to from the government or just being given tablets. And I thought I'm a pretty smart guy and I've lobbied their MP and I've got their MPs to, to pursue their case. To, and they've also needed lots of reminding and chasing. And the terrible thing is the local MP in Bedford was replaced. He lost his seat three years ago. The new MP never received any of the papers. And I thought, shit, it's not, it's not my job. I, I'm just doing because I'm smart. But I, I haven't got time to chase it. I've, and I have it on my conscience that I've abandoned these guys. 
At the same time, last week I met a guy at the gym, 21 years old, who signed up to become a sniper. Oh. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> Microphone, please. There's a lady just behind you. Um, thank you. A question for Jake. Um, I'm wondering whether you think your experience might have been different had you been a regular soldier rather than a reservist. And also, what do you think of the government policy in the future of shrinking the regular army and placing increasing reliance on reserve forces? Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Um, yeah, the TA is like I said, to double in size, um, and the army, the British army, is, is due to reflect the American army in, in making greater use of uh, reserves. I think it's it's possible that that could be practicable, but only if the the um, a very unique challenges that a, a TA soldier that faces are addressed, and one of those is um, the uncomfortable fact. And it is a fact now. It's been backed up by King's College London in, in their research. Uh, uh, statistically, like, TA soldiers are markedly more likely to get PTSD than regular soldiers. Now, I don't believe it's because we're, you know, morally weaker individuals or anything like that, but it, apparently it's got something like to do with um, this juxtaposition of experiences, this this fish out of water experience you'll have where literally one day you're in Iraq or, or Afghanistan and then the next you're suddenly back in like Savvy Street sitting at a desk or after a few weeks leave, like sitting at a desk, like, trying to, you know, surrounded by people who through through no fault of their own, have not the faintest idea what you've just been doing, seeing, experiencing, feeling or not feeling. Um, and it's that sense of profound isolation which can be the final push over into PTSD. And that was for sure what happened in my case, without a doubt. So as long as these issues are addressed and as long as you know, the TA units themselves realise their responsibility to um, you know, these TA soldiers who, who come back from tour, that that can be a place where these TA soldiers can, they can go off, they come back from tour, and they can talk about things with like-minded people who may have been on tour with them, who will know exactly what they're talking about. Next question. Sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry about your question about the future of the British Army. We might not deal with that quite today. Um, where's the microphone? Yeah. Uh, Charlie, uh, I wonder if, if the difference in the British and American desertion rates that you described was due primarily to the fact the British were in the war two years longer and the first two years were the worst years of the war. It's entirely, it's entirely the fact that the British were in longer. Year by year, the numbers were more or less the same. Secondly, I just wondered if you happened to cross any data on the desertions among the Axis Armed Forces. They were very... The armies, when they were losing or having tough times, tended not to desert. When they were and so when they were losing, they tended to desert. When they were winning, they tended not to. So the Germans had very, very low rates of desertion in the Battle of France, for example, um, and, in, and in North Africa when they were winning. But when they were losing the war, the, there were so many that there were no statistics. And, and the German, the Wehrmacht policy was to execute them almost immediately, if they were caught. Not, I mean, not even a short court martial. OK, microphone around, please. Um, uh, Chris King's my name. The other people who can't escape these conflicts and have no control are the civilians. Have there been any studies in the prevalence of PTSD amongst Iraqi and Afghanistan civilians? And that must surely have a very bad effect upon the ability of those societies to actually function. Without a doubt. Yeah, uh, so. These civilians are, are human beings as much as you know, the soldiers, but, but um, you know, I, I'm not aware. I, mean, I just don't know. I don't know if you know. Charlie, do you know of any... I don't know that it's possible for doctors from our part of the world to go and function in those villages and talk to people about their traumas because um, they would not be that welcome because they come from the same institution that traumatized them. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it's, a, it's an important observation I think you've do, made, do, even do if we can't answer it as a question. I think someone. Oh there, yes, we have some information here. Hello. Please keep it a bit tight. We're running out. Yeah, time. no, I'll keep it really tight. So my name's Gavin Reese, and I work for. Dart Centre for Journalism and Trauma, so we provide trauma awareness to journalists. One of the um, tricky things about a situation like Iraq is that in order to get post-traumatic stress disorder, you need to be away from the conflict. 
So if you're living in a society where the conflict's still going on, then it's not post. So in other words, it's quite, you know, it's very difficult to measure whether people still have a, a lingering reaction. But the figures from places like Algeria, which had a long history of conflicts, um, Algeria is a pretty extreme case because there was a lot of torture in the, in the society as well, both carried out by the French and carried out later on by subsequent governments. But the rates there are, are probably around 40%, and that's what you find in Rwanda. So soldiers do get PTSD, but civilians tend to get more PTSD depending on their exposure. But you have to look at the kind of case-by-case -case, um, situation, example. Thanks, Gavin. Oh, uh, there's just behind, pass the microphone just behind if you can. Excuse me, Charles, I'm wondering if you came across medical staff who also had uh, PTSD. I had an uncle who went with Patton. He was a doctor, young doctor across Europe. And uh, he was with Patton when they opened up the concentration camps. And um, he, they were awash with medical supplies. He treated the women and children, German women and children as well. He was court-martialed by Patton. For what? for using medical supplies to treat German civilians. And um, he got PTSD. He was demobbed out to a veterans hospital in Washington, DC. And they had no people who would treat the people who had PTSD there. And they forced him to treat them, although he was just a doctor. And he said, but I'm ill. Uh, when he was demobbed, he became a psychiatrist, lasted two years and took 90 sleeping pills without water. Uh, it took my father, who was a young solicitor, 10 years to get him declared a war casualty. He had two small children and a wife. And I just wondered if there are other cases, if you've come across them. The only ones I came across were medics, uh, corpsmen in the, in the field who were basically frontline soldiers, but without carrying weapons. They were carrying stretchers and bandages, and they were as traumatized. But in terms of overall medical stuff, Steve, Steve Weiss might know because he was there, but I, I'm not aware. No, he, no. Um, we've got time for one more question, and a gentleman over there, I'm sorry, I apologize, gentleman over there has been um, exercising his arm. Thanks very much. Um, firstly, thank you very much for writing your books. Um, I was in Bosnia, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and um, I remember distinctly coming back from Baghdad um, for R&R &R and being in the green zone one minute and then being at home in uniform, body armor and helmet over my shoulder and having a beer put in my hand at my girlfriend's house. Um, and I've heard PTSD, PTSD being called adjustment syndrome. Do you think that's a, a watering down or do you think that more accurately reflects how you feel? Um, <clears throat> I definitely had adjustment issues um, because I was having problems readjusting to like home. But... Um, you know, just in my case, uh, I don't think an adjustment disorder would include uh, like flashbacks and, and nightmares like to the intensity that I, I can have them sometimes. I, I, I'm not sure if that's part of the diagnostic criteria for adjustment disorder. I don't know if that's just an attempt by the military to um, you know, try and you know, water something down for their own reasons, I just don't know. Um, but I can only speak for myself now. I, I look at the, you know, the diagnostic criteria for PTSD, and it's like, yeah, 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 that's what, that's what I got. Um, <laughs> that'll be that then. Um, so um, I need to find out more about that, you know, that adjustment disorder. But, but I can definitely relate to it, you know, when I came back from Iraq each time. You know, in truth, I, I never really adjusted. You know, you know, to life back home, I kept on wanting, I wanting, wanting to go back to a world that made more sense, as insane as that sounds now. Um, I, just before we wrap up, I just want to talk about the size of the problem we have. I mean, we've had this military exuberance on ex our expeditionary wars of choice over the last 10 years. Um, and uh, Charlie, I mean, if we had 100,000 people deserting and suffering from PTSD, and a lot more clearly who were suffering from PTSD who didn't desert, perhaps because you didn't have the opportunity. Um, I'm wondering whether you could comment on, on, on what you feel uh, might be the size of the problem we're facing now. I mean, and uh, I'm wondering also whether you might just ob observe it. I mean, to what extent are colleagues of yours or friends of yours who you serve with suffering in the same way that, 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 that you are? Well, in the 
three campaigns in which the desertion rates in Europe, I mean, in the Second World War, were highest in North Africa, Italy, and France. Um, the soldiers were not rotated. They were in battle for months at a time. That, that doesn't, you're not under steady shelling for months at a time. In a, you know, in, in those, it was almost like trench warfare in the First World War. In fact, there are great similarities, particularly in Italy. Yeah. And the pressure on them was so great, and, and the fact that they were never rotated out and could go weeks and weeks without a shower hot food. So the pressure on them was, was much greater, so I assume that the rates would be much higher. And then also the opportunity, um, you can blend in in Italy and France where you can't in Afghanistan and Iraq. So I think that the rates are, are much higher for a, for a variety of reasons. I mean, people in the American soldiers have deserted, but they've, they've done it when they've gone back to the United States. They've re refused to go back, or they've, yeah. run, or they've gone to Canada, and they've sought asylum in Canada. And they, they run in, there are a few thousand of those. But how many are, are just down as AWOL and are not, are not admitted as a We don't know. And when I tried to find out from the Ministry of Defense here, the, re the, the, the rate of desertion, the number of deserters in Iraq and Afghanistan, they wouldn't tell me. Mm. They won't reveal those statistics. The rate of PTSD, because obviously... No, 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 the, the desertion. Oh, there is, oh, right. They won't tell you how many people have deserted. Yeah, they're not too happy to give some of that information away. What, what about Jake, in terms of uh, your sense of this, um, how many people do you think are experiencing from the last decade of conflict the sort of uh, suffering, the injuries that you have? Um, there's the official numbers. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, okay, okay, there's the MOD numbers, and yeah. then there's statistics uh, uh, compiled by places like, like King's College. And then there's, and I can just speak from my own experience. So, and when I got back from Afghanistan, you know, we had this briefing, and it said 99.9% uh, .9 of soldiers will not suffer from PTSD when they come home. Now, that's clearly, true. that's bollocks. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> you know, it is. You know, I mean, you know, and um, the official, well, uh, King's College did you know, a wealth of research, and I think for um, for TA soldiers at least, it's you know, they reckon it's about six percent of like soldiers. Um, but again, it's one of the themes you picked up in your book, Charlie. It's like, um, just because a soldier's been to a certain country does not mean that he's been doing certain things. So the majority of like, soldiers in the Second World War were not combat troops. So they saw no combat. It's exactly the same thing with like today's armies, um, where it's just a, it really surprised me, this, this quite small minority of troops actually go out to the forward operating bases, actually do the jobs for real. And, and um, anyway, so uh, third observation, you know, my personal experience, um, I know that out of nine, nine of us from the HAC and my TA unit who were deployed for that tour, uh, three of us were diagnosed with PTSD and another two, um, I think, if they admitted it to themselves, they would have gradations of it. Um, yeah, and uh, in my team out in Afghanistan, uh, his five-man team, the officer just disappeared. I was just nice. And, I, and um, I've noticed symptoms in all the other three guys. One guy's definitely got PTSD, without a shadow of a doubt. The other lad read my book and go, oh, now it all makes sense now. I thought I was just going mad. And then and the other lad, um, I've had him, um, I've had him break down in tears in front of me now, and um, which you can't do in front of a, in front of anyone else. So, um, it for sure, it's a lot more common than uh, 0.1 percent. Well, I think. Um, I'm going to start ending this now. I think that um, I think we've all learned several things, and I, I was very moved um, by what the lady over there talked about in terms of her father. And, and I just wonder whether after this meeting, when we start thinking about the shame of desertion, the shame, apparent shame of having PTSD, where that shame really lies, um, because I don't think it really does lie with the deserters, as we call them. Perhaps it lies within all of us, this shame. Perhaps there's something else there. And so on that note, um, I would uh, like you to thank our panellists um, and please buy their book. I think this is a really important discussion.
and uh, we can talk about it more at the bar. Anybody who's got some money in their pocket who'd like to buy us all drinks? Yeah.